Hello, my name is David Murray. I'm the NIH Associate Director for Prevention and Director of the Office of Disease Prevention. I want to welcome you to Part 5 in our Pragmatic and Group Randomized Trials in Public Health and Medicine course. This is a free seven-part self-paced online course presented by NIH. Um, uh, we uh, provide the slides for each module, a complete set of readings for the course, and guided activities for each module. Um, this uh, particular day, we're going to talk about examples of group randomized trials. Uh, the course uh, is designed for faculty, postdoctoral fellows, and graduate students interested in learning more about the design and analysis of group randomized trials. It's also designed for program directors, program officers, and scientific review officers who need to know more about these designs. Participants should be familiar with the design and analysis of individually randomized trials and with concepts of internal and statistical validity, their threats, and their defenses. We'd also like participants to be familiar with linear regression, analysis of variance and covariance, and logistic regression. At the end of the course, participants will be able to talk about the distinguishing features of group randomized trials, individually randomized group treatment trials, and how they differ from individually randomized trials. Participants will be able to discuss the appropriate uses of these study designs in public health and medicine, and for group randomized and individually randomized group treatment trials to discuss the major threats to internal validity, to statistical validity. We'll be able to talk about the strengths and weaknesses of design alternatives and analytic alternatives, and we'll be able to perform sample size calculations at least for a simple group randomized trial. Participants will also be able to discuss the advantages and disadvantages of alternatives to group randomized trials for the evaluation of multi-level interventions. The outline of the course is shown here, uh, and today we will focus on some examples of group randomized trials. Uh, the examples that I'm going to share with you today are uh, from the Healthcare Systems Collaboratory. Uh, this is a project funded by NIH uh, as a common fund project. These are funded as cooperative agreements. Um, they're funded by a variety of different uh, institutes and centers across campus. So they're not all from cancer or all from heart, lung, and blood. They're, they're really spread out. There are nine of them that are currently funded. Uh, and as it turns out, eight are group randomized trials. Uh, this is not terribly surprising to me because uh, pragmatic trials are, are often done out in the real world, working with existing systems, and so very often uh, employ group randomized trials designs. Uh, the eight that use the group randomized trial design are listed here. Uh, in terms of the outcome that they're focused on. So one is focused on hospital-acquired infections, another on colorectal cancer screening, and so forth. Uh, I'm going to talk about several of these, but not all of them. And the first one that I'll talk about is um, uh, based on colorectal cancer screening, and it's called the STOP Colorectal Cancer Project. Uh, this is a project that's led by uh, Gloria Coronado uh, and Bill Vollmer at Kaiser Permanente. Uh, the primary objective of the STOP CRC trial is to test the effectiveness of an automated electronic medical record driven uh, strategy to raise um, colorectal cancer screening rates in safety net clinics. The primary outcome for this trial is the proportion of targeted patients who complete FIT kits uh, during the first year of the intervention. This is a group randomized trial. Uh, there are 26 federally qualified health clinics that have been randomized to intervention or control. They are affiliated with eight larger administrative networks, and it's um, uh, clinics that are uh, randomized. Uh, they are uh, randomized within networks, so we think of this as a stratified uh, uh, random uh, assignment. Uh, clinics uh, within uh, networks uh, randomized to conditions. We use the uh, electronic me medical record to um, drive the system level intervention, and the electronic medical record is also the source of the data uh, for this trial. Uh, control clinics are going to roll out the intervention in the second year, and uh, consent was waived for participants because this was considered a minimal risk study. Um, this particular example illustrates a priori stratification in a group randomized trial, uh, with clinic as the unit of assignment, and uh, it also illustrates a delayed treatment control condition. Uh, the analysis approach that's planned for this study is a weighted logistic regression uh, accounting for clustering at the clinic level, adjusting for selected individual and clinic level covariates. Individual level data uh, will be weighted by the inverse of the clinic size so that the resulting clinic means all have equal weight. Uh, this is consistent with the primary focus on clinic level outcomes. Um, 
the, uh, there's a paper published by Gloria Coronado uh, in 2014 that provides details on the design and analytic plan. Uh, this uh, particular analysis illustrates a mixed model and COVA approach uh, adapted for a dichotomous uh, outcome variable. Uh, challenges that uh, the STOP CRC project has faced uh, as it's gotten underway. Uh, as it turned out, there was going to be overlap of year one measurements and year two uh, intervention rollout for control clinics, uh, so that had to be addressed. Uh, the use of real-time electronic medical record tools um, uh, wasn't always concordant with uh, static uh, randomization tables. There were implementation delays uh, with the uh, Affordable Care Act rollout. So all of these challenges threatened the validity of the primary analysis. Uh, uh, in terms of solving these real world problems which happen in many, many group randomized trials, uh, the team delayed the rollout of the intervention uh, for the control clinics in the second year to address the overlap problem. They formulated a variety of sensitivity analyses to try to overcome lags in startup and so get a, a more accurate estimate of the true intervention effect. Uh, and uh, they adopted a stepped wedge framework in which data from both years one and two, as well as a year prior to randomization, is used to estimate separate startup effects for year one uh, and the steady state effects in year two. So these are uh, additional um, supplemental analyses, secondary analyses that will help with the interpretation. Uh, adaptations, as I said, are often required uh, over the course of a group randomized trial because these studies are typically done in the real world. Uh, the next example that I want to talk a little bit about is the chronic pain management uh, uh, study or PACT uh, and the primary outcome here is uh, chronic pain management. This is a project headed up by Lynn DeBar. Uh, uh, the biostatistician is again Bill Vollmer. Uh, this is another project from Kaiser. Uh, the primary objective is to test whether an integrated pain management program that's embedded within primary care uh, will be effective in reducing pain, reducing opioid use, uh, improving or reducing uh, healthcare utilization, and improves uh, uh, function for patients uh, who have a condition that involves uh, chronic pain. Uh, this is a very timely project given all the interest these days in opioid use, um, and um, so it's of interest to an awful lot of people. The primary outcome uh, is the trajectory of change in self-reported pain scores over the first six months of the intervention. So this is a different kind of outcome. It's a slope uh, that's being estimated using data, and then we, we estimate a slope for each person and uh, compare those across groups and across conditions to see if there's an intervention effect. Uh, this is an example of a stratified group randomized trial. The strata are the three regions of the Kaiser, Kaiser Permanente Health Plan. Physicians are the unit of randomization in this study, not clinics, but physicians themselves. Um, the electronic medical record is used to screen and identify potentially eligible uh, patients. Uh, the patient uh, potential patient lists are then vetted with their primary care providers, and verbal consent is obtained from patients prior to randomization. This is another uh, study that illustrates the stratified group randomized trial. And in this case, we have the physician as the unit of assignment. In the first example, we had clinic as the unit of assignment. The analysis plan is a two-stage approach. Uh, the first stage would calculate a slope and in individual pain scores for each patient. Uh, then those slopes would be analyzed using a mixed model ANCOVA, um, adjusting for selected individual and cluster level uh, variables, including baseline pain score. And there's a paper from Linda Barr published in 2012 that um, uh, provides details on the rationale for this approach. This analysis plan illustrates a two-stage analysis, also reflects regression adjustment for covariates, uh, uh, an approach that's very common with group randomized trials. Uh, challenges that the PAC study faced, uh, part of it was weaving a very complicated multimodal intervention into the fabric of usual, uh, the usual care in the intervention uh, uh, for the intervention providers. Um, everyone was doing lots of different things that they hadn't done before, uh, so the study involved uh, redeploying or hiring new clinical staff for intervention roles that weren't necessarily well aligned with the existing health plan structure or the traditional activities of the office. Uh, this study expanded the use of the electronic health record. Um, there was a challenge creating a scalable training model. Um, costs are often an issue. Um, 
Uh, IRBs uh, are uh, often also challenging. We think that that situation is going to get easier going forward because uh, pretty soon uh, multi-site trials are going to require, at least funded by NIH, require a single IRB rather than multiple IRBs. Uh, these kinds of challenges just reflect the fact that pragmatic trials are not easily, uh, especially if you're doing something for the first time in a new system with new methods, uh, and the PAC team had to work on a lot of these issues out. They adapted the intervention structure to accommodate the clinical workflow. Uh, they had to redefine uh, some clusters by grouping PCPs together uh, due to smaller than uh, expected numbers of consenting patients for some providers. They had to delay the startup in some regions until the systems were ready. Uh, they had to shift some of the sample size uh, between regions to reflect what was possible. So there was a, um, a variety of adaptations that re were required to uh, uh, adapt uh, to the circumstances that they found. Um, as the next example, I want to describe the uh, TSOS project. Uh, this involves management of post-traumatic uh, stress disorder and trauma patients. Uh, this is a trial uh, directed by Doug Zatzik um, uh, and the uh, uh, biostatistician is Pat Hagerty. All of these folks are at the University of Washington. Um, the primary objective is to explore the intervention effect in patients uh, with pre-injury chronic medical conditions and the primary outcome is post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. Uh, this study is using a stepped wedge design. Now, we haven't talked in much detail about stepped wedge design, so I'll pause and give you a, a little more information on this one, uh, this kind of design. Um, a stepped wedge uh, design uh, uh, has a group, a series of groups that are going to receive the uh, intervention. Uh, groups are selected in random order to receive the intervention following a baseline period. So all of the groups provide baseline data all of the groups provide intervention data. Over the course of the study, in a stepped wedge fashion, the intervention is, is introduced into all of the groups. Uh, in this case, there are 24 level one trauma centers that, were, that are randomized to uh, four waves. So in the first wave, at the beginning, everybody provides up, uh, uh, control data. And then um, uh, the uh, uh, first six trauma centers uh, receive the intervention. A while later, another six, and so forth. So uh, it's a stepped wedge uh, design. The goal was to recruit 960 patients with PTSD, 40 patients per trauma center. Uh, all of the trauma centers recruit both control and intervention patients by virtue of this step wedge design. All of them begin by recruiting controls, and the data are collected at baseline three months, six months, and 12 months. The intervention is turned on at each trauma center based on the step wedge design. Uh, one of the advantages of the step wedge is that all the trauma centers get trained on doing the intervention over the course of the study, but the design does add analytic complexity. Um, so uh, one of the features of this project is that it does illustrate the step wedge design. The um, uh, intervention and control comparisons will be made for PTSD symptoms, that's the primary outcome, but uh, the team will also look at alcohol use and depression. Uh, subgroup analyses will focus on uh, participants who have traumatic brain injuries or pre-injury medical conditions. Uh, there's a paper by Hughes et al. published in 2015 uh, that provides a discussion of some of the analytic issues in uh, the stepped wedge uh, design uh, and uh, uh, illustrating mixed effect regression approaches uh, with uh, adjustment for covariance. And here's the uh, reference for that paper. Uh, challenges. Uh, there was considerable variability uh, among the sites. Uh, they varied in the uh, extent of violent injury, uh, and of course there's more PTSD with, with uh, violence. They've, the sites varied on a variety of other characteristics. Uh, the uh, stepped wedge design actually helps with this uh, variability. Um, implementation challenges. Um, the American College of Surgeons mandated um, activities for PTSD screening and intervention, so all the sites do want uh, training. Uh, the solution, uh, as I said, the step wedge design actually uh, addresses the site variability per, by providing the intervention in every site so that every site contributes both control and intervention observations. Um, 
uh, the team dealt with the uh, requirement from the uh, professional society by uh, providing the training to all of the sites, uh, at least by the end of the study. Uh, the, uh, another example that I want to talk about is a study called PIECES. Uh, this is a project that uh, focuses on management of chronic uh, conditions, multiple chronic conditions. Um, it's run by uh, Michael, uh, Miguel Vasquez um, and Chul Ahn is the primary statistician out of the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. The primary objective of this study is to evaluate the management of patients with uh, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, and hypertension with a clinician support model um, that's enhanced by technology support, and that's the PIECES intervention, compared to uh, standard of care. Uh, the primary outcome is uh, one-year all-cause all hospitalization among participants that are in the trial. This is an example of a stratified group randomized trial. They have four healthcare systems with almost 250 clinics and more than 35,000 patients who are available for the study. Within each healthcare system, clinics or practice sites will be randomized to either pieces or standard care. And every patient assigned uh, to a particular clinic or practice site uh, will get the treatment uh, based on the uh, randomization of the clinic or practice site. Uh, as I said, this illustrates the stratified group randomized trial design. In this case, the clinic or practice site is the unit of assignment. The primary analysis uh, in pieces will be the generalized mantle hansel testing procedure uh, published in a paper by Alan Donner in 1992. The, uh, this procedure will be applied to detect any difference in hospitalization rates between pieces and the control condition. Secondary analyses will use model-based methods, uh, mixed model logistic regression to assess intervention effects on hospitalization rate, controlling for clustering in patient and other uh, covariates. Cox models to uh, assess the intervention effect on time to hospitalization with a shared frailty to control for clustering. Um, this uh, study illustrates the use of a non-parametric approach to the primary analysis and model-based approaches to secondary analysis. Uh, challenges uh, faced by the PIECES project are summarized here. Uh, there was a challenge getting consent waivers, but that was worked out. There was a challenge with uh, the heavy workloads among the participating centers. Uh, streamlining the clinical workflow uh, at each of the sites. Uh, certainly there were competing priorities for a variety of things, but especially with some of the technology development that was required for this project. There was a slow approval process at one of the study healthcare systems that slowed things down, and then there was training of all those PCPs and staff at each of the sites. These kinds of logistical problems are common in pragmatic trials, especially done in healthcare settings. Uh, the team uh, is addressing those. Um, and so we'll move to a summary of, uh, from these examples. Um, group randomized trials, individually randomized group treatment trials can be applied in a wide variety of settings for a wide variety of primary outcomes. Uh, group randomized trials should be uh, avoided if individual randomization is possible with no threat of contamination or interaction among participants post-randomization. But if you've got the threat of contamination or there's going to be interaction among participants post-randomization, the group randomized trial or individually randomized group treatment trials provide the strongest design that you can have. These studies are often conducted in settings where investigators have limited control and teams should include experts in the settings and operations so that they can address those issues as they arise, not just in the interventions and outcomes. I want to thank you for participating today in part five of our course on pragmatic and group randomized trials in public health and medicine. I want to draw your attention to our website where you can provide feedback on uh, today's material. You can download the slides that you've seen in this module, the references for the entire course, and suggested activities to follow uh, this particular uh, segment. You can view this module again, or you can view the next module in the series, part six, a review of recent practices. If you have any questions, please send them to grt.mail.nih.gov. And thank you very much for your attention.